everybody this is Ed uh, back with uh, another not I wouldn't say review but another episode of call me mr. Broadstreet I wanted to do a proper video for uh, the Beetle Fest uh, the virtual Beetle Fest in my case uh, for the New York New Jersey uh, 2022 fest uh, I'm doing this approximately a little over 12 hours from the last live stream uh, now that I've gotten at least a little more sleep and I kind of put some thoughts together and have some notes from what I observed. Uh, first of all, uh, just if everybody's enjoying the video, please give a, a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. I appreciate it. I'll start off with a little inside joke for some of you watching, but uh, yeah, I've even got the, uh, even got the lighter out. <laughs> well, the, the explanation of the joke for the folks that uh, aren't in on it. So basically, whenever there was a really good number uh, during the virtual fest and I was watching it on chat, I would sometimes break the lighter out and kind of, you know, like at a concert, you're breaking out the lighter, you're holding it up. Uh, somebody asked yesterday, oh, you know, when did cell phones kind of replace that? And I said, well, at least five, ten years ago, uh, definitely when I saw Elvis Costello in 2017, it was much more cell phones, people holding it up, recording it, you know, having the light out versus the lighters at earlier times during concerts uh, from about the 70s to the 80s and even the 90s. Uh, but just a uh, nice little inside joke, nice little bit of fun to start things off. Uh, I just want to give one more quick shout out to uh, Warren at the fest. Uh, Warren, I believe, was helpful uh, in the chat with, um, as one of the folks instrumental in lining up Mark Lewis and to do the specific chat with the virtual group. Uh, as I described last night, we couldn't see the presentation that Mark Lewison was doing on the Beatles time in India uh, because of copyright concerns. There was material and everything that they didn't want being recorded. Um, so that was a very nice treat that they were able to bring Mr. Lewison to chat with us on the chat and answer our questions as I alluded to um, in my earlier video earlier now this morning. Um, very early this morning. Uh, but just a few uh, observations as uh, I'm uh, going through and kind of was re-remembering some things, writing some things down that, that I remember uh, from my perspective. Uh, so first, just the collector's panel. That was the one that I described where uh, Susan Ryan was co-hosting. Uh, Tom Hanyadi and Andy Nichols from Two Legs were there. Uh, Ethan Alexanian, who's done the artwork uh, for Two Legs as well, were all there. Check them all out. Very amazing folks. Uh, just basically... Uh, you know, we had uh, one of the topics, I believe, was kind of the aging of collectors. And, of course, you've got Tom, who kind of represents my generation of Gen X. Ethan kind of representing the Gen Z generation. And two other first-generation fans, I guess, representing you know, the, the boomer uh, demographic. Uh, one interesting question that came up was, what's going to happen to all these collections as folks are passing and values can kind of fluctuate if it's not a, a super high item? Um, and I think I may have been in this forum or elsewhere, but I think it was this forum that, uh, not in my notes actually right now, but as I'm thinking of it, a lot of people think that every single Beetle item is worth a lot of money. Not necessarily the case. Certainly if you've got an autograph, that's going to be worth some money, a, a legitimate autograph, uh, sure. So a lot of really interesting, uh, you know, takes on, on that. Uh, someone else brought up there was a lot of fakes that could be out there, uh, for example, one of the folks in the audience, um, they might have mentioned Al Sussman. I'm not 100% sure. I know he's been a longtime Fest attendee uh, and very, very big in the Beatles community, uh, going going way back um, as uh, a fan, and, and definitely he knows his stuff. Uh, for one example, the Beatles' 1963 to 1969 Christmas album, uh, that I think it was him that got it in person from the Apple headquarters in New York City, paid something like $2.50 for the Beatles Club membership, and they gave and handed the record to him, so they know it's a legitimate record. But a lot of them online may not be a legitimate record, so it may be repressed, it may be a fake, it may be 
you know, something else. So to be careful of that. And there's certainly a lot of that out there, unfortunately. That's across all fandoms. You find that stuff at Comic-Con. Um, you certainly find that, I'm sure, with other things, coins, stamps, whatever people collect, really. Um, moving on. So Peter Jackson and Michael Lindsay Hogg. Peter Jackson, director of the Get Back film. Michael Lindsay Hogg, the director of the original Let It Be film, where they got all the footage from. Again, as I mentioned before, Peter Jackson was kind of interviewing Michael at a certain point. Peter just took over, you know, and it was a joy to watch again. As I said before, I, I really wish they could have kept that going. That was fantastic. Um, look, Peter's a super fan. He knows his stuff. I'm trying to keep it family friendly here, but he knows his stuff inwards and outwards. I'd love to see him do stuff on the solo years. I think he would do it justice. Um, again, one topic that came up, allegedly, I'll say allegedly, Alan Klein had designs on MGM at one point, which is kind of a new revelation. Uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg was just stating that uh, Alan Klein was kind of at least fair to him personally, but I don't think he was excusing the other business dealings or the other somewhat rather shady practices, let's just say. We'll keep it at that. I don't want to get sued by anybody, um, but you know, that's that's kind of what uh, you know what, what that was about. But a lot of interesting topics. I'm going to go back and rewatch that. Uh, I know the fest is going to have it up for about another week, I believe, uh, something along those lines. I uh, just want to reflect on the Liverpool band and Lawrence Juber as both uh, two musical guests at the fest. Liverpool, they're an amazing fest sound like band. Uh, I think I've seen them. At the last Chicago Virtual Fest last year, uh, they were, I think they were doing a gig from live at Daryl's house. Um, I know I've seen them. Now, I don't know if, I don't think the gig may have been from that Chicago Beatle Fest now that I'm thinking about it, but they have played there before, uh, live from Daryl's house. Very, very good web series that I've, that I've been able to catch. Uh, shout out to my stepmom to, uh, you know, recommending that one uh, with a lot, a lot of different bands. Um, they really nailed it with the performances. They kind of ran the gamut from kind of the earliest Beatles stuff to, you know, Abbey Road, you know, the, you know, the whole gamut, and, and some solo stuff as well. Uh, then something really special happened when Lawrence Juber, Lawrence Juber being from The Last Incarnation of Wings from the uh, 1979 Back to the Egg album, joining them. Uh, some of the solo songs I want to point out, Band on the Run, I mean... Even if there's a little bit of fan fatigue on my part, I mean, yes, it's a masterpiece song. I cannot deny that. Um, really, you know, amazing guitar work on that. Uh, the finale Sunday was the Rockestra theme from the 1979 Wings Back to the Egg album. And I'll tell you, fire. It was shredding. It was, you know... As I said earlier, I mean, there's no slight to Jimmy McCulloch, who's a very, very amazing guitarist in his own right, uh, for Paul Sally's book, which I read. Uh, again, no slight to the other Beatles, um, but I think Lawrence Juber really just is in a class by himself. The tea time with Lawrence that he's done on Facebook, the acoustic, the electric, he makes it look so effortless. I don't play an instrument. You know, I just look at it. It, it, it makes it look easy, and I know it is not easy. It takes years of mastery and training. He, he makes it look like it's just nothing at, at all, and quite the opposite. Uh, but moving along, so Billy J. Kramer, he's kind of a fest favorite, uh, singing the song Bad to Me, which was composed by John Lennon. Uh, kind of an early Beatles track, I want to say 1963 was when it was released. And again, if I'm getting anything wrong, folks, you know, put it in the comments. I really want to always get feedback, you know. There's stuff I may miss after all this time. I know I definitely don't know, uh, do not know everything. Um... But it's always a treat to see him uh, at the fest. I do remember him when I went in person in 2002, the, the year after George uh, had passed. So far, my only in-person uh, fest that I've been to so far. Um, and I know recently, I think Billy had lost his wife within the past year or so, past couple of years. So just the fact he keeps trucking, he keeps going, he enjoys the fan interactions, you know, really, really... Really great to see. Really happy to see him up on the stage. Uh, at one point, he was up there with you know, Lawrence Jubers on guitar, and he's playing along, and Billy's taking the lead. Uh, circle, uh, again, the famous spelling. Uh, I won't go into that, but 
C-R-Y-K-L-E, I guess I just did. What can I say? I uh, got their band name from John Lennon. It was the only U.S. act managed by Brian Epstein. Uh, they opened for the Beatles during the 1966 tour, Red Rubber Ball being their major hit uh, that, I, that I have heard over time. Um, now, Mark Lewison had the first panel, which we could see at the Virtual Fest. Uh, I think it was Bruce Spizer. I'm pretty sure it was. I apologize if I'm getting it incorrect. Um, but when I saw it, a lot of the discussion was the difference at the time between U.S. and U.K. radio, among, you know, other topics. Um, but at the time of the Beatles' first visit, so we're talking 1964, Mark brought up an interesting point that the U.K. really had no commercials at the time. Uh, versus the U.S., which had, you know, plenty of commercials. Uh, another point I thought was really interesting, that the U.K. could actually only do 22 hours of music between the three BBC stations uh, at a time per week. I just found that really interesting and kind of why the Beatles may have found themselves on another, another planet, so to speak, uh, back in 1964. Uh, real quickly on the art gallery, again, they just had some signed pieces from John, Paul, and Ringo. I think they had a couple of George pieces as well, uh, some Ringo art for sale that was signed, some Paul stuff that was signed, some lithographs and paintings. Uh, John signed, I think as I described in the last video, the last live stream, uh, that big picture of him from 1980 tuning the radio, which is actually one of my favorite pictures. It's got the signature, but you could keep that picture there, or you could take the picture out to reveal the erotic lithograph, but again, I think they're trying to keep it kind of family friendly, uh, maybe for little kids walking in. Um, not big on censorship myself either, but, you know, I guess I can kind of understand the reasons. That's obviously their call, um, uh, not mine to make. Uh, let's see, Lawrence Juber with the Talk More Talk interview. I forgot to mention this in my last live stream. Uh, the Talk More Talk interview with, uh, Kid Tool, Ken Michaels, and Tom Hanyati. Uh, I know Joe Mayo was usually part of it. I didn't, I don't think he was there, though. I think it was just the three of them from what I could see, interviewing uh, Lawrence. I don't want to give too much away. They're going to do that on their episode. Uh, I know one interesting fact was the Good Night Tonight Flamenco solo, kind of done in one take. I, I thought that was really interesting, but catch their episode. They're going to air it. Um, I'm going to have to rewatch it as well, because, I mean, just being in the moment, trying to absorb everything. They do amazing stuff over at Talk More Talk, uh, and Two Legs as well, both amazing, you know, um, amazing podcasts. Uh, definitely they continue to be an inspiration for me. So thank you guys for interviewing Lawrence. That must have been a blast. Um, let's see, there was an uh, onstage interview with Chris O'Dell. Uh, now she was uh, she was an Apple, uh, she worked at Apple Records uh, as kind of an assistant. I think she said at one point she was an assistant to Peter Asher. I don't have that in my notes, but I kind of remember that. Um, she was on the rooftop for the 1969 concert, one of the few staff actually on there, on the top the rooftop uh, at that point, uh, with Mal Evans. Um, the song Miss Odell, which George uh, wrote and eventually did put on All Things Must Pass from 1970, that was a song written about her, kind of made her famous. Uh, really nice interview, she seemed really down to earth, but you know, she's worked with some amazing company, I mean, not just the Beatles, but after that, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, and Carlos Santana, among other folks. So, again, you know, just going from the U.S. over to the U.K., no job prospects lined up, going to work at, at uh, Apple Records, all very unplanned. I mean, wow, you know, just amazing, amazing story. I actually, uh, I'm hoping to buy her book, uh, Miss Odell. I'm hoping to purchase that uh, and read through that. That's just sounds really amazing. Uh, let's see, just a couple other quick thoughts before we're wrapping everything up. Uh, there was an interview with uh, Greg Bissonette. Now, Greg has been Ringo's uh, current drummer on tour since about 2008. Um, had to kind of look that up, to be honest. But uh, one interesting point he made is about kind of being a good musician is really kind of being a good person, a team player, not really complaining about things. You know, I'm willing to kind of go with the flow. Uh, if you complain a lot, you may not get a lot of gigs. And I think that's true for life. Not that you can't stand up for yourself when there's something really egregious or wrong but kind of willing to be a team player, you know, not complaining, oh, I didn't get the top of the line suite at the hotel, or, or you know, why am I not getting, you know, room service every day, you know, five-star room service. I mean, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, he, uh, he also touched on the kind of set lists, because uh, we all have our favorite songs. We all even have 
hits that actually don't get played at concerts. Uh, I've said it with Paul enough times. Um, you know, there's certainly songs from Ringo. Uh, I think the specific song I mentioned was Tomorrow Never Knows. You know, if he, if he just started drawing on that. But, you know, Greg made an interesting point. Look, Ringo's kind of the boss. Ringo has the final say. Greg really can't just go off script. He might not be working for Ringo anymore. So, I mean, it is very much the hits. It is very much people want to hear the hits. I can understand that. I may not 100% agree. I think there's some deeper cuts and other hits you can kind of switch off. Um, that's my own personal view. But, you know, I, I can see where people really want to make the money off of the hits as well. Uh, but that was just kind of an interesting take, I, I thought. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, finally, there's a really nice moment with the Battle of the Bands. Kind of like, you know, fans, amateur bands kind of battling up on the stage. Now, I didn't get to catch all of them. I only got to catch the last two. Uh, I'm not going to name the bands, as honestly, I can't remember the names, and I certainly wouldn't want to call out anybody. I wouldn't want that done to me, and I would never do that to somebody else. Uh, but as I can remember, the events was kind of one band, uh, the first band I saw, got up there, they, they were nervous, the lead singer was nervous, and that's understandable. Look, it takes a lot of courage to get up there on stage. I couldn't do it. I would be losing my lunch, to be quite honest with you. Extremely nerve-wracking, being in front of all those people, being in front of, what, maybe a thousand people or two thousand people in a ballroom? I, I don't know, you know, but I, I would lose my lunch. I would not be able to do it. Props for having the courage to do it. But I think, you know, the amazing thing is that there was a second band up there. They were the eventual winners of kind of the Battle of the Bands, okay? But the great thing is with that previous band I'm describing, the audience was helping them out, you know, with the song, uh, you know, singing it along, really supportive of that band. Uh, I know when they all got up together, kind of everybody up on stage, you know, the bands are fist bumping, going, hey, it's all right, it's, you know, you did good. And it takes a lot of courage to do that, um, you know, and, and that's why, you know, we, we've got to be kind to each other. I, I really think that. I really think we've got to be kind, understanding. Hey, if everybody could do it, everybody would be up on stage fronting a band. I couldn't. That, that, not in a million years. No, I wouldn't. Um, you know, so I think that's just what makes the overall Beatles community an amazing place to be. I'll echo what I said last night. Very supportive very amazing you know a lot of love out there you know uh for for folks and i think a lot of respect and a lot of respect of different opinions um but we all love the beatles that's the reason we're all doing this that's the reason i'm doing this channel that's the reason i keep doing the reviews that i do um so that's really it just my reflections as i'm going to move on to my next uh regularly scheduled review um but I just wanted to put it out there in the uh, you know comments below. Please feel free to comment, to give feedback. Does anybody else have any other Fest memories they want to share? What was your perspective on this uh, Fest for Beatles fans for 2022? What's been your perspective or stories for the past Fests that you've gone to? Please leave some you know, feedback in the comments. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, other than that, I will see everybody in the next review. And again, if you're enjoying the content, uh, please make sure to, you know, just keep watching. And of course, please give a uh, thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Please spread the word. I appreciate all the support, all the new subscribers and the current subscribers. Thank you so much. It it really makes my day. It makes me appreciate you. And I'm really happy at what I'm doing. So uh, other than that, I'll see everybody in the next review. Until later. Bye. <music> Thank you.